Welcome to the Workflow Show. I'm Nick Gold. I'm here with my co-host, Jason Whetstone. Hey, everyone. And this is episode 302. We'll just call it Media Silo. Media Silo. And we have a special guest with us, as has been the trend as of late. We've got the, what is it, Kai? Kai Pradle, founder, CEO, genius behind Media Silo. <laughs> yeah, founder, CEO. Yep, that, that's, that about sums it up. Well, Media Silo is a, a company, a technology that we've had involvement with for a good number of years now. Um, full disclosure, we are a partner and reseller and integrator of slash with Media Silo. Uh, but of course, we only feature people on our show that we, we like and we like their technology. Mm -hmm. We think it's a good fit. Jason, this is one that you've had some very deep dealings Lots with. Lots of experience with, yes. Over the years. Um, actually... Uh, it all started back in the days of Final Cut Server, actually. Media Asset Management, the company I was working for, was looking for a way to uh, show some of their Tier 1 clients um, what kind of, of footage we had uh, in store for them, uh, what we were sort of managing for them. And uh, we considered building our own front end, our own web-based front end for that. And uh, one of our developers said, well, why don't you check this out? And he showed us Media Silo. And that's that's where it all started for me. So let's do it this way. Let's let's let Kai, for the sake of our listeners, tell us a bit more about Media Silo. I'd love to hear uh, not only kind of the, the the summation of of what various kind of cloud based you know media review approval sharing mini mam type tools you guys have, but a bit about the company itself, how you guys came together, the founding process, your own background, and kind of the angle that you come to the, the video and media space from? Sure, absolutely. I miss those Final Cut server days, Jason. That, that brings me back. <laughs> <laughs> and, re and reminds me that we've, been, uh, that we've been doing this for a number of years. So yeah, so, so Media Silo is, is really a, uh, a lightweight um, media asset management and collaboration solution uh, that's cloud-based. And we kind of, uh, we developed it out of the need to have a tool for ourselves. In a former life, um, uh, I was part of a, a production company. We were doing commercial production. And um, at the time, there really weren't any tools that worked great with video. And we got to a point where we did uh, a casting session for a big national bank for a commercial. And, you know, it just took four weeks to get, you know, their approval on which talent to move forward with. And it was all because of technology, essentially. So we decided, let's just write something and build something better. And, and, and that was kind of the genesis um, of Media Silo. I mean, had you, know, you they, had you done coding before? Or had you been involved with software development projects? Or was yeah, this just I, like a bright idea that, you know, turned out to be a lot more work than you expected? Well, to be honest, my heart has always been sort of split between, you know, video and and uh, engineering and software. So in a former life, uh, um, I had started a software as a service company that ended up in the hands of one of the biggest uh, media and entertainment companies. Uh, at Viacom. So my background and my heart is kind of with software development and, and I and I really enjoy solving problems from a from a technological perspective. So I'm I'm not really a, a coder by trade, but I'm dangerous enough to to make things happen as, as many of us are. And over <laughs> the years uh, that's just sort of turned into a love for developing web based application to solve problems and workflow problems specifically. So you built this thing and I mean, tell us about the trajectory, because you this was how many years ago again? This was in 2009 that we really started with Media Silo. So five, yeah, over, a little over five years ago now. Which is like and, ancient history in the world of like media technology right. solutions, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's right. Wow, that, that has been a while. It, doesn't ha it certainly hasn't felt that long. Yeah, well, we we just started out building a small tool set that we would, uh, you know, that we gave to to friends and other producers and said, hey, you know, try this out and we had an open registration at some point and and uh, overnight got registrations from New Zealand and the UK and all over the place and we didn't really take the tool too seriously and we're just sort of delighted that somebody was giving us feedback on it but there was a turning point when we realized wow this may be a, you know a much more interesting sort of endeavor for us at this juncture as we were picking up steam and and so in 2009 we released the first version of it which was back then based on flash and flex technology and uh, it was it was you know back then it was it's rare to have entire applications 
run in the browser stack. So uh, we were we were kind of at the forefront of that. And then the tool has really evolved. We're now in the fourth generation of the product. We're kind of getting into the fifth generation. And uh, it's exciting what has happened over the last few years, you know, in our space, but uh, but also with regards to what we now can do with, with browser technologies and what's, what place the, the cloud is taking in this. So So let's not make any assumptions here about, you know, terminology and things. This thing was born in the cloud, if you will, like a Care Bear, I suppose. <laughs> um, Unicorn. <laughs> somewhere up there in the clouds. <laughs> um, what does that mean? I mean, what exact technology platform is Media Silo based on? How is it a cloud-based application, both in terms of storage and the application layer? You know, Break it down for our clients so they understand where this thing fits in their overall infrastructure relative to local production storage and on-premise media asset management and workflow automation and transcoding systems. This thing's like somewhere else. So maybe you can kind of get a little more specific about that. Yeah, so the the, the kind of the exciting thing about any cloud-based service, I think, is that it's sort of turnkey and it's provisioned immediately. And there's no software to install. There's no servers to configure. And and that's that's really the the main promise. You can get started with a cloud service without really having to, to to do a whole lot or have a lot of technical expertise. And certainly, you know, for review and approval, we all know that Creative Pros kind of like to you know take the the path with the least amount of friction. It's five o'clock. You want to get something out the door. You you, you don't you don't want to deal with help desk internally because you can't transfer a file to a server. You just want a tool that works. And that's where, that's where cloud services really come in handy. And uh, over the last few years, you know, there's, there's probably, and anyone can probably name five or six cloud services that they're using. But in 2009, you know, this, it would, we still pretty much lived in a world where a lot of software was installed, you know, final cut server that Jason just mentioned was an installed product. It was on prem. And so we found ourselves as kind of an anomaly in, in a wide field of, um, of you know, sort of st traditional software uh, installed behind four walls type of scenario. But what that meant for us was that, you know, we were one of the first users of Amazon S3, and they, they actually wrote up a, a case study about us. And uh, we, we started the company just at the right time because we were projecting our storage needs, and that was really difficult. But very quickly, we realized that we would need a lot of storage. So we had either the choice of building internally, doing a co-location type scenario where we put our servers in a data center and the storage in the data center. But uh, then we happened on this, this Amazon S3 service. And back then, they didn't, they didn't have anything but S3. That was their only service. There was no EC2. There was no Glacier. Glacier there was none of yeah. that. Um, and so we started using it, and for a startup, it was excellent because we had very low cost. We could scale um, with with increased demand, and it helped us really, you know, get get our uh, feet on the ground and and get the product off the ground. Great. So let's take it through. You know, again, for folks who may or may not be you know familiar with Media Silo, and we obviously encourage them to check out your guys' website because it's fantastic. It's you know, very easy to kind of take a look at some of the demos and read some of yeah, the Yeah, and there, the, there's a there's a free yeah. offering there that, you know, allows yeah. you to kind of, you, you know, sign up check and it out and check it out. figure out how it works. Another benefit of being in the cloud is that you can like, you know, press a button and, you know, give them a trial, right? But why don't you take them through kind of where you see the product fitting? What workflow needs does it address? Obviously, the, there's this storage component and it's cloud-based off-premise storage using Amazon servers. You know, paint the picture for our listeners, if you will, Kai, about you know, where Media Silo fits in, its core, you know, tool set, and you know, just where you've seen some particular successes with it for different types of clients. So, in terms of the most common use cases, Media Silo is a review and approval and a media management application. So, media and re media review and approval is kind of at the core of the product. That's how we started out. And uh, today we, we're kind of a media management system in disguise of collaboration. And what that means is that on, on a on a day-to-day -day basis, a user may upload files to Media Silo to share with another group for review and approval, get comments, export those to their to their you know editor, and uh, sort of rinse and repeat that cycle. But 
but really what what ends up happening in almost all cases is that as you do that as you upload review cuts you realize that you're really building a library of different versions but you're also building a library of b-roll and you're beginning to really start to, to, to think of this more as an asset management system and that's typically how we evolve so in the door media silo is is a collaboration and review and approval tool uh, with mobile apps, with a desktop app, with a browser app. And uh, the longer a production company uses us, the more they realize, hey, this is actually maybe our path to an asset management system. And so as such, you know, the, the, the much bigger picture for us is to play a role in what we call democratizing the media, which is making mm -hmm. media more visible in the organization and giving more people, you know, more stakeholders ready access to, to the media both inside your walls and obviously outside, it's as equally accessible to anyone who has an internet connection, right? As long as, what, basically port 8080 is open and they can view web pages, they can, they're they pretty much good to go, right? That's right. Yeah, that's another advantage of just this cloud-based mindset is that it's all web accessible, right? So I, I would say that that, you know, a few years ago when we started, we certainly felt like we were educating the market to an extent because there was a backlash against the cloud and people didn't really know, you know, can we trust this or not? If it's not behind our firewall, is this even safe? And I mm -hmm. think this is not to our credit, but just to the in industry in general, there's a shift in mindset to where media and the cloud doesn't ne doesn't necessarily mean that it's not secure. There's There's ways to lock things down. There's ways to secure things. And once you've come to terms with that, then the cloud really frees you from all the perils of, you know, sort of maintaining an infrastructure yourself. Managing ports and servers and all this stuff certainly is, is like chief among those. Well, and I know a lot of our clients, they use services like Vimeo or YouTube. Yeah. And they may have some, I was some protections in place. Actually just going to, going to, ask you, Kai, to can you kind of compare and contrast um, how Media Silo works as opposed to something like Vimeo or YouTube? Like, you know, what what you're saying, I mean, it sounds like I could probably just use like a, a YouTube account to do that. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, if, if you look at, you know, Vimeo is primarily a distribution platform, right? It, they, do have, they, they do have tools for uploading your own videos and protecting them. But if you look at the core business of how Vimeo makes their money, it's a distribution channel. So, and we see that across the board. YouTube is a distribution channel. It's not really meant to be a tool set for content creators. It's, it's uh, you know, a certain breed of content creator that you know, distributes directly, but uh, where, where Media Silo sets itself apart is that it's a collection of tools that's really geared towards the video pro. Uh, we understand the workflows that, that make video work, and we understand the supply chain of video from when it comes off the camera, when it goes into your logger, to your NLE, to, you know, the cloud for review and approval. So that really, that's really what, what separates it. Uh, you know, on the, on the surface, if you're looking for just review and approval tools, you know, you're, you're going to find that um, you have a lot of options out there, but as far as taking it to the next step and, and really fitting into the day-to-day -day workflow of somebody who produces a lot of content and does it professionally, that's 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 our niche. That's how we fit yeah. in. Yeah, and, and I mean, you guys have great user management tools and notification tools and, you know, all kinds of things that really speak to that, I would Med say. Metadata, keyword tagging, mm -hmm. the ability to import rich metadata through your guys' extensive APIs. So if you are exporting something and publishing from an on-premise MAM, into Media Silo, this is something that you've been working on lately, Jason. Mm -hmm. You can kind sure of spit have. some of the metadata through to you guys so they can become search parameters, obviously time code based annotations and kind of subclipping capabilities so people can you know, not just type a little response for the, the, the piece as a whole, but can you know, have marker and subclip level annotations to you know, speak collaboratively with other people on their team about, hey, this little portion right here needs such and such, and this little portion right here needs such and such, and oh, I like this, and oh, this stinks, and you know, you guys even have like transcription services that are you know outsourceable through the platform, correct? Yeah, we have a uh, services, yeah, services integration, that, and transcripts is is one of them. And that's that's what's really exciting about cloud-based technologies. I think that we're seeing this um, this you know new push towards APIs. I was listening to your your metadata podcast 
with uh, Nexidia, and and I think one of the takeaways was that every every one of your panelists there was talking about APIs, and that's what we can bring to the table in, in terms of a, a cloud-based platform. We can tap into these different APIs, and we could bring the services together so that you as a user don't have to go to transcription, you know, to to transcription vendor and go to an encoding vendor and go to a media management vendor, but find all that under one umbrella. Yep. And from a developer standpoint, you know, media silos API is very straightforward. You know, it's a REST API, very easy to use, very well documented. So it's great. So tell us about some of the different types of clients who are using media silo and, and again, what the workflow looks like for them. So Clients really range from small to medium-sized production companies uh, all the way to the big five. So we support anything from you know a single user to 5,000 users. Surprisingly, though, the workflows are pretty similar across the board. So just because we're supporting a bigger company and a bigger footprint, it doesn't necessarily change what people do with the platform. At the core, it is an easy way to upload your video, play it back, share it with, with people aggregated online, enrich it with metadata. Um, but there's there's definitely some some workflows that stand out that only a cloud platform can really provide. Uh, an example is we're, we're working with a client that is uh, in the middle of a huge digitization project and they're digitizing uh, a quarter million hours of content and they have no idea how to properly capture metadata, which is you know a whole you know series of sessions in of itself. I know you guys absolutely um, have talked about this in the past, but so what what uh, what Media Silo is doing? It's essentially a platform that allows them to outsource the logging to a a group of loggers that are anywhere, right? So instead of outsourcing the whole project. They can now manage their own team of loggers. They have 20 or 30 loggers. They have a web-based platform where these loggers can log in at all hours of the day. They're not managing people in a you know central location where they clock in and clock out, but they're using this uh, the power of a distributed platform to to work together to get a lot of footage logged. Uh, so that's 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 one of the the more exciting projects um, on a large scale. But really, on on any scale, it's it's all about managing media, managing metadata, making it accessible, and building on top of that. Um, what we're seeing a lot is uh, an uptake in, in our API to build things like uh, stock footage store, storefronts. I had a conversation with uh, a production company here in Boston where they uh, they created a documentary for CBS about the Red Sox, and they, they shot uh, 90 hours of, of footage. And the finished piece that they that they licensed is an hour and a half, which leaves them with a ton of footage. And as you know, there's a lot of avid Red Sox fans. So they were looking for a way to monetize that content. And they said, hey, why, why can't we just set up a, a, a storefront? And um, so we see our platform used for that, for that purpose as well. That's interesting. Very nice. Talk about what the model is that people you know, have uh, for subscribing to Media Silo. Because again, it's not something you buy. It's something you subscribe to. So what does that look like for you know, an organization? What are the, the metrics that they get charged based on? So it's primarily around the number of users. There's two options. We're, Media Silo is storage agnostic. So if you want to bring your own Amazon account, you can, you can do that. In that case, you control, control storage and you control bandwidth. Um, and you also pay the, the, you know, the retail Amazon prices. Or we have a turnkey service, and it's primarily priced around the number of users. But I think what's interesting is that, that especially with small to medium-sized production companies, we see that there's a real interest in reselling this as a, as a service to their clients. So yep. we, we work with um, companies that are not traditionally video producers, but that have thousands of hours of product testimonial videos or, or product you know, training videos. And uh, the production companies that are generating that content and, and are in a vendor relationship with those clients, they use Media Silo as a media management system to that or to that company, so that all of a sudden there's transparency, there's a turnkey cloud platform, and and now there's visibility into the assets that are available. Do you guys allow kind of white labeling and people to skin the Media Silo experience so it's kind of branded around their own entity's branding and things like that? 
there, there is there is customization. There's there's no white labeling. Um, we did that initially, but we really found that it's actually an asset to a company to to know that Media Silo is behind this because you have a support number to call. You know, you have a chat uh, window that you can log on. So if the end user has a question, it's not the production company that has to answer the question, but it's actually us that that picks up the phone. Got it. Got Great. it. So is there a difference? Yeah, I I think there is. I would submit there is in many ways, but you know, it'd be interesting to hear your response. What is the difference between a MAM and a workflow automation platform of the sort that people might have on premise in the form of Reach Engine or Cat DV or EMAM or you know even something like Avantage or you know Cantamo, what have you, and what you guys are offering in the cloud, you know, through Media Silo? Can you compare and contrast and talk a little bit, and then we'll probably steer in this direction, talk a little bit about, you know, do these things kind of interface with one another? Do mm -hmm. they solve different problems, and yet they can kind of be joined as one? Yeah, that's, wow, there's a lot in that question. Yes, <laughs> there sure is. <laughs> I like packing things tight. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's like a facet of answers. Um, so I think, I think um, workflow is obviously very subjective and it's it it's very it can be very complex at the beginning of, of every workflow is visibility and having a central place from which things can take place maybe maybe the best way to illustrate how we look at workflow is is by just kind of explaining how we would integrate with custom you know a custom workflow how you could create your own custom workflow we're very web centric so the team here we're we're 22 people we have 10 engineers and and we're all really avid web developers we we look at what's around us and we look at what the web in general is doing when it comes to workflow automation so there's services you may have heard of like if this and that or zapier yep does that ring a bell mm -hmm. at all? yep yep so they have nothing to do with workflow, right? For for traditional post production use cases, but what they're doing is they're it's it's sort of the parallel in other in other industries. If you if you want to automatically send a tweet when there's a new file in your Dropbox, then Zapier can do that, or if this and that can do that, and um, and so this is a really interesting breed of product that we're looking at. So the way we're looking at um, extending our media management platform is through what's called webhooks. And so when an action is performed in Media Silo, let's say somebody edits a, a tag of an asset, then it sends a webhook to a service like Zapier, and Zapier then can interpret that and say, oh, there was an asset update event, which means that I should probably feed that back into my you know, main asset management application, or I should send a notification to somebody like that. So we're looking at workflow from the perspective of how can we be a piece of the bigger puzzle and integrate with with services that are starting to revolutionize workflows in areas not just within post production. So we're a little bit less specific in terms of triggering a sequence of events directly within Media Silo and letting you script that. Though you could certainly do that with the API, but we're we're steering our customers a little bit more in the direction of what what is what is the web doing in general and what opportunities exist with ready made tools that are not going to cost a ton and uh, that can be customized easily. Gotcha. Now, you also have a lot of clients, I believe, who are integrating Media Silo with on-premise management systems, correct? That's our, our most common use case. So mm -hmm. I've actually done the, three of those, yeah, right. <laughs> three different yeah. MAMs. <laughs> you should talk about this. Um, no, but this is a really good point because the existing MAMs are either in place for a long time and, and there's a high cost in switching those. Uh, we're we're certainly not trying to replace a traditional dam system. That's that's not our place. Um, there's a lot of complexity in building something like Final Cut Server or North Plains. But I think what we do a lot of is be the transparent layer to that media, and be the flexible layer that can be you know that's sort of consumer friendly, and that goes goes back to democratizing media. So you have media in different locations. Let's say you're a company that has three offices and you're storing media in those three locations. You're trying to paint a picture of, you know, ha have, a, have a single place to go when you're searching your, your media. And uh, that's hard to do for most asset management platforms. So, you know, we work with Cat TV a lot. And uh, that's certainly a use case that comes up a lot there. You've got different Cat TV catalogs or, or installs in different locations. There's no easy way to then bridge that and create one simple, you know, search query that 
retrieves assets across the board. So that's that's a use case we support uh, quite frequently. Yeah, that's well. That's one of the things that I love about Media Silo is is the flexibility. I mean, at, at the very basic level, you know, to get media to Media Silo, you pretty much upload it to a virtual FTP server, which is that's that's the, I mean, that's the most basic level of integration. But then you can extend that with the API to doing you know metadata trans you know transfers and um, you know queries and all kinds of different things. So that's you know one of the things I love about it. Jason, you mentioned earlier that one of the projects you did had to do with exposing media to clients of the organization that you did the the, the integration between the on-premise MAM, and mm-hmm. I think that had started as a Final Cut server. And then you ended up kind of redoing the media silo integration around Cat DV once Final Cut Server died right. and, and they had moved over to that. And so it was a way of, again, on the cloud without prevent, you know, presenting any barriers or impediments to the clients, give them a site that they can go into from any computer to right. review stuff that the company was working on for them. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. What was the other use case? I, I know what it is. It was different. And it's a different kind of use of media silo in some ways. Maybe Are you talking about uh, the, as, as the opposed more, to the review and approve? Yes, the more yeah. recent one, without <clears throat> mentioning maybe the client by name, but uh, we probably um, will do a, a full on yeah, uh, case study soon. But. I've actually done uh, two different clients with this use case, which is they, they wanted a place that they could uh, upload their media to so that um, TV stations or radio stations could access the media. You know, very simple form of distribution. It's got to be controlled, though. We only want certain people to be able to get this media. And this is so those broadcast entities have access to versions that are of a high enough quality that they can then download. Broadcast quality media, exactly. Not necessarily, we're not talking about 4K here, but we're talking about broadcast quality media. And uh, in in both scenarios, uh, the reason that that Media Silo was chosen was because the client um, was kind of struggling and fighting with their IT internally about... Well, we'd like to have an FTP server so that we can send, you know, FTP links to, you know, our radio stations and TV stations so they can download the media. And I remember in the second case, I had already done this for for another client. So I said, well, why don't why don't we just do Media Silo? I mean, it's you know, it's kind of a perfect solution for this. Well, and it's better than FTP <clears throat> because it gives someone a very nice, rich web based exactly. user interface where they can view the media directly if they wanted to enter any annotations or notes or things like that. Yep, they could. And uh, in this particular, uh, the second use case here, we're using Media Silo's notification system to notify these broadcasters that there's something available for them. So they get a notification. Uh, essentially, the, the way the workflow works is the user within their MAM just selects a, you know, a clip or a video that they want to upload to Media Silo, and that's, that's pretty much all they have to do. They select it, they push it up there, and uh, the broadcaster gets a notification, hey, here's something for you to download that that will be broadcast. So instead of a, a push-based system where the content creator has to take the act of, of, of pushing something to the other party directly, whether that's a server, right. you know, it, whether it would have required setting up an Aspera link, you know, mm-hmm. high-speed public internet, you know, accelerator, file transfer accelerator technology on both ends of things, which is potentially infrastructure-heavy, capital-heavy, you know, and, and again, forcing a lot of you know, interactivity between the client and then the end broadcaster in order for that broadcaster to get a hold of the things to put to air, so to speak. This kind of, you know, inversed it in a sense, right? Right. It it made it a self-service system. Exactly. That allowed the broadcaster at their leisure to go through, search, get access to the broadcastable versions of assets that, you know, through a, a, what, a push button action in the on-premise man, right? It's pretty much a right click, you know. Send, send, send to, send to partner via media silo, and that is, is this what was it's called. most recently was with Reach Engine that we did mm-hmm. this, right? Yep. And and uh, the other the other thing that's great about this is um, with a product like Reach Engine, you have so much flexibility with the workflow develop, you know, the, the workflow tool to be able to, um, let's say you've got three different broadcasters all expecting different transcode settings, you know, for their for the media that they'll be broadcasting. You you know you can push all three different transcode versions to different projects in media silo give your broadcaster all the different contacts usually the sales guy the you know there's a bunch of different people at each broadcast organization that need to get notifications so you set them all up as users and you give them access to the different projects and then you know when they get 
uh, media, they get a notification. It works great. Is metadata getting passed as well? And what are the types of metadata that mm -hmm. that client has chosen to pass through that that separate corporate entity, the broadcaster, would would want to have and be able to search on in media silo? So in in this in this case, no, there's no metadata being trans transferred in, but. There could be via the API. Um, also, I believe uh, Media Silo's Final Cut server integration still works. Um, last I checked, it did. Uh, and we parse we we parse uh, XMP metadata in file. Header that's right. As well. Yes, absolutely. Um, so if, if you're if you're in if you use um, a Prelude or use a Premiere and you're you're editing any metadata, that automatically gets sent along and read. Yep. Yep. So totally doable, easily doable. Or you Jason, can... you just uh, you you said something earlier on that I thought stood out and I think is worth worth talking about a little bit because you you said that they had a um, th this use case started out where they had a problem with their IT department and they wanted to do something they wanted to you know upload their clips and uh, this is something that we hear a lot I think we're sort of in the middle of this revolution not just within media and entertainment but when we're looking at software as a service in general it's changing how software is sold and it's changing who is the decision maker behind you know making these buying decisions and it's really the creative pro that is more and more front and center of of deciding what tool set is used in an organization it's no longer central IT that says we're implementing an asset management system but it's the user that says I have a problem this is my pain point I need a solution and uh, more often than not a user will you know, choose a tool that is either a freemium tool or is inexpensive and that just gets the job done. So exactly. you know, something like a Hightail or a Dropbox or maybe a, even a Vimeo or something like that. And this is really fascinating because it's, it's, it, it, we see it everywhere. And I think, um, you know, for us, that means that, you know, we just released a, a desktop client of, uh, of our Quick Links app. Which let which lets you just you know drag drop send clips to, to other people and 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 have this nice review and approval context with it, but uh, th this is really driving a whole new generation of of products. The fact that as a creative pro, I can now go out and for a few bucks a month procure a tool that gets around IT and that gets me the solution, right? Yeah. And so I think this is important for two reasons. A is the creative pro is in a in a it has an incredible amount of power and control over choosing this tool set now. But I think from a central IT perspective, and it doesn't matter if you're a 20 person company or a you know, 5,000 person company, I think it's important to know that as long as you can you can combine those two strategies, which is you know the, the, the company's overarching strategy to get a handle on asset management and secure things and you know have some control over where assets are, and at the same time not be in the way of the, the creative pro needing to get their work done, then you have a winning combination. And we see this everywhere. You see this with Basecamp, you know, mm -hmm. where teams just go out and for 20 bucks a month get a you know project management account. And we see this with various tools around the web. So I, I, I just thought that was worth mentioning because well, we definitely see a ton of that. And trust me that when, uh, when the creative professional goes back to the IT department and says, don't worry about that FTP server. We solved our problem. We're going to take care of it another way. The IT people are usually like, great, you know, we're relieved. We don't have to, you know, set up this special thing for you now with open ports and all kinds of special considerations and yeah, bandwidth funny. and all that. You mentioned earlier, Kai, that there used to be security <clears throat> concerns about using the cloud for storage of proprietary assets. And I think a lot of the situations we find ourselves in, having someone push something up to the cloud media silo and allowing very granular access to those assets amongst a very self-selected group of people through that you know, robust platform, Amazon, you know, they've got their security experts looking at everything 24-7, right? To us, that represents a much higher level of security than opening up all sorts of aspects of your own infrastructure to mm -hmm. let people into a self-hosted system that now someone could theoretically slip into and then, you know, have run of the place, you know, from the IT infrastructure perspective. So, yeah, to us, I think it's actually pre presented itself as a high security option to Absolutely. put things out on, on media silo. And now, I've seen that um, over the years, um, you, you know, I, like I like we talked about earlier, I, I started working... Uh, you know, with with Media Silo very early in, in you guys' um, you know development, and I've seen you know the, the sort of development over the years of how you guys have been concerned and responding to your clients' concern about security, password protecting quick links, um, yeah, being able uh, requiring um, strong passwords 
for users, all that kind of stuff. It's you know, it's gotten, in my opinion, very much, uh, very much secure. You know, Kai, you were mentioning some of the other kind of online software as a service collaboration tools. You mentioned Basecamp a moment ago, and that's kind of an interesting segue. I wanted to bring this up. We obviously have a lot of different levels of collaboration that take place across production, post-production, distribution, broadcast, et cetera, right? And review and approval of media is a very common type of collaborative activity that takes place in this world. Uh, as we were talking about a moment ago, being able to distribute your media as a content creator and pushing it out to the distributor or broadcaster, very you know, important collaborative act of getting the thing that you've produced out there. There's a lot of other types of collaboration that take place in this space, though, like project management, management of project files that you may be working on, versioning of project files, not the media assets necessarily, but you know the Premiere project, et cetera, you know, the Final Cut 10, mm -hmm. whatever they call it these days, the library or whatever, right? <laughs> um, you know, uh, your Avid project. The paradigm. Um, you know, you've got versioning, you've got checking in and checking out. You know, Adobe themselves, through their Anywhere platform, again, which is a very on-premise type of technology build out, despite the fact that it kind of turns aspects of your facility into a, essentially a, a private cloud. But they've got this collaboration hub that's part of Anywhere to start to handle some of these other collaborative workflows that take place around the project and the different types of people who might be involved, the producers, the editors, you know, AEs, you, you, you name it. Can you talk a little bit more about maybe some of what you guys have going on, either currently, what some of the vision is, about where you think your platform can start to step into some of these other spaces that involve the collaborative tasks that happen day to day in post-production broadcast and how you know maybe that would fit into the existing set of offerings, any thought about additional offerings, Again, there, I just find all these needs. I mean, I can't tell you how many times Farmer's Wife, which from what I gather is a kind of slightly not loved, you know, file maker based database for actual production and post production, you know, management tasks. But again, it's a it's a file maker database that you run on premise, and a lot of people just rely on it because it's kind of what's out there. Have you guys looked at this stuff? And I mean, maybe you can hint at what's either out there or what's coming or what you guys have you know, thought about. Yeah, that, that's a great question, Nick. So I think you have to, as, as a company, you just have to sort of understand your, you have to understand your, your focus and the problem that you can solve. We've looked at extending Media Silo to do more in the production space, you know, to deal more with project management, to deal more with sort of auxiliary information that's not pertinent to the assets. And I think we've just, we've, we've honed in that the problem we want to solve, the problem that we see and we hear about every day is, is, is removing friction in, uh, for creative pros, making it easier to get review cuts to uh, the users, making it easier to uh, distribute the files, to put them in a central location, to enrich them with metadata. So the direction that we're going is really to, to look at the creative pro, the individual, as our main use case and what, what they try to, try to do. And at the same time, look at what kind of role can we play in the larger you know, in the larger organization. So can we solve a, a distribution problem for the editor and also a security problem for the enterprise so that, you know, sort of there's a there's a top to bottom and bottom to top approach. And that's what you'll see us focusing on. But that also means that we're looking at ways that we can make video smarter and we're looking at ways that given that we have sort of an API first mindset that we can consume other APIs to make video more relevant. So, you know, I'll give you an example. If you uploaded a file, we currently will create waveforms, we'll create sprites, we'll create different proxies, different, you know, we'll transcode the video in different formats so that if they ever get requested on a, on a mobile device that requires a, a specific codec, you can play it back. What if you could also, by default, you know, run a phonetic search over it? Or what if you could do automatic uh, key keyword tagging with every asset that's uploaded? And what kind of impact would that have in your organization if that happened on aggregate? You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's not the individual clip you upload that maybe needs all this information, but if you use a tool like this and your team does over a period of an entire project, then at the end of the project, you're trying to find that one clip or that one outtake or, you know, the, the, uh, 
the the piece of b-roll that got discarded and we make it a little bit easier for you to find that i think that's sort of the mission that we're trying to be on and the problem we're trying to solve so if i'm if i'm kai pradel am i trying to forge you know b2b relationships with people like nixidia or maybe even amazon's mechanical turk service and things like that so i can keep offering more and more things that are possibly cloud oriented and and you know just bring added value to my clients of media silo is that kind of sounding like your perspective? Am I being fair? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think we're, we're totally embracing the technologies that are out there, the serv services that are out there, and we want to make it easier to, to put them together and cons consume those. And I think that's exactly the role that a cloud ma'am should play, mm -hmm. you know, is, is, is bringing together the best of breed tools and, and consolidating that under one simple to use interface. Can I, can I give you a free idea? Please. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's a need I see out there. And frankly, out of, I think of all of the software technology vendors out there, there is certainly the ability probably for some of the MAM or DAM vendors to do this. And some of them are kind of in this space. But frankly, I, I think as a cloud-based service, it makes a lot of sense for you guys to look at as well. Maybe it's something you're working on. Heck, maybe it's a feature of the, of the platform that's there that I'm just not as familiar with. Let's say I am, you know, we, we handle, of, of course, a lot of backup issues for our clients, right? We, we yep. build SANS, we build NASs, we, we, we build big ass, you know, big arse. I just said arse, by the way, listeners. Um, oh, wait, we're not on the radio. I can say whatever the F I want. <laughs> um, we build, you know, all of these storage systems and we build backup systems that can, you know, are Sync typically volumes. oriented around, yeah, a whole volumes worth of media files. We build these systems out to handle, you know, changes that may occur in the largest volume of the data you're dealing with, which is the raw media. Because you don't really have to worry about re-rendering stuff because as long as you've got your project file, you right. can re-render. And, you know, so you really need your project files to be well-maintained and backed up. And you really need your media files to be backed up and well-maintained and, and preserved, of course. And with those two, you can constitute pretty much anything you need to just through a re-render. And we can build all sorts of systems that, like, let's say with a daily level of granularity, can back up you know, any new or changed raw media files that have landed on your primary production storage volume. And so you can flip over the Frankenstein switch and say... You know, we're going to go to tier two for today. You know, that's our backup volume, and it's yesterday's version of the data. And, you know, in a lot of cases, that day level of granularity for the raw media is perfectly acceptable because of just the volume that they may ingest on a day-by-day -day basis is not great enough where the loss of a day's worth of that stuff is a big deal. And they can keep, you know, the, 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 the media that came in from the field, you know, around a couple of days so they can re-ingest it if they need to. And, you know, they're back up and running very quickly. The challenge tends to be with project files. And we're mm -hmm. like, well, yeah, I mean, you know, you're going to capture daily level granularity of your project files if they happen to be on that shared storage volume as well. And frankly, it's not always appropriate for those project files to be on the shared storage volume that often is used for media storage purposes. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. I would love to see, because you could kill a couple of birds with one stone here. You could have an offering, call it Project Silo, I don't know. And let's say it's a panel inside of Premiere Pro. It leverages Amazon's web services. And what it is is basically a web-based repository for the project file itself that you're working on inside of Premiere. And you hit it exclusively through a panel built that you guys would build out in Premiere, right? And what it would do is capture, maybe with hourly granularity, changes in deltas to project files that you're working on. And I don't know if that can be automated or requires someone to push a button or whatever, but it would give someone the ability to not only know that they're capturing kind of more granular you know, versions of the project file as it, change, as it changes, and of course that can happen many times throughout a day, but they also know that that's being backed up to the cloud. It doesn't cost a lot of money because the project files are small. It's convenient because... They can grab those project files again from wherever they're sitting on the planet as long as they're on the web. And it's it's kind of, it could be both a versioning and a project file, you know, version and check-in, check-out kind of platform and a cloud-based 
you know, kind of disaster recovery platform for your editorial project files. Is that something that, you know, you guys have given any thought to? It just seems like there's a need there. And while some of the on-premise MAMs can do that, I see just a whole lot of value of, of having that be a cloud-based service. So what you're talking about is like, are you familiar with GitHub? Yeah, yes. sure. Mm -hmm. So it's like a GitHub for your for your project files. I think that's a really good way of describing it. But it sits within Premiere and you can access it from there and you can look at your history. Maybe you can even see a list of differences. Uh, yes, yeah. yes. You're reading my mind, man. <laughs> I like it. You know how they pitch well, movies in Hollywood? Like apparently the way they pitch <laughs> movies, it, it has to be like something meets something and has a baby. So, right, the, right. The, you know, this this would be like your premiere panel and GitHub, you know, got and, together and had, and a, baby, had a baby and it would be this what, new thing. Okay. Yeah, what you're talking about is like the it's like the perfect mashup scenario, right? That's exactly mm -hmm. how kind of we're viewing the space it's it's taking uh you know taking elements from you know web development and merging it with the the video production world i mean that's the stuff that that we live and die for. so here's an idea you guys build what i just said i'm a great idea guy right but psh, I, you know execution that's for all the much smarter people <laughs> i people work like with <laughs> yeah, like that guy right across from me right there you know we'll, we'll let them but how about you build this you you drop me like a little credit in the splash screen or something, right? <laughs> Compliments me, of Nick Gold. You give me no more than twenty five percent of the gross <laughs> revenue. I'll I'll sell the hell out of it. But but you you get the idea and seventy five percent of the profits. Yeah, no, I, I, I and, love it. And I think, might I just I say that Nick could sell ice to an Eskimo. That's not true. I'm not even a sales guy. <laughs> well, I'm, let's, I'm, let's, I'm like a let's consultant. Let's give a little bit of credit here to Adobe as well because. You know, without without the possibility of building panels and plugging into that ecosystem, you know, these ideas wouldn't be wouldn't be possible. And that's that's another direction that that I'm hoping that we'll see our industry go, is more towards embracing collaboration and interoperability, and mm -hmm. being less about you know proprietary stuff. Well, we know that there was a big video company that's now you know, not as big and prominent as it used to be that, um, you know, kind of very much never really took that approach, even if they paid it lip service over many years, but yeah. it tended to be a very siloed look at things. And, you know, I, you know, you're, you're, you're talking about this future where it's like, you're almost, you're building your own application layer, right? As a user, you're defining what workflow you need. You're picking and choosing the pieces of the, the technological ecosystem out there. You know, oh yeah, I like cutting in Premiere, but I want to do my project management in this platform and I want to do my medium asset management with this one. And I want to do my archive with this. And I want to, I want, and yet I want to have kind of a unified interface. I want it to be streamlined and I kind of want to build my own platform and tools out of these multiple vendors options. I think Apple was kind of in that direction originally with Final Cut, you know, through seven. Mm -hmm. Adobe seems to be moving in that direction as well. But but seriously, in all seriousness, run with that idea about the cloud-based project backup and, and management and check-in, check-out and versioning, and our clients will eat it up. We have actually uh, experienced people using Dropbox People for, for Dropbox for what is Nick what was, they're using. Dropbox yeah. is what they're using. Because the files are not real big, so they're just kind of throwing them on a Dropbox just to get them and backed it's like up that's, somewhere. It's, it's like, okay. I mean, sure, I'm a Dropbox it's a good user, manual way of doing it. But if it was yeah. through a panel in Premiere, actually did kind of more concrete version control with check in, check out processes, whew, go and make some money off of that one, Kai. Just send me a. <laughs> send me a Hanukkah well, Christmas card or something the, in an edible the, the arrangement. Downside, you know? <laughs> the, the downside to this mashup world is that the you know the ability to monetize these things is also infinitely harder, right? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Because it's you know it, it's accessible and you can build it and and ten dollars a month per user. Done. Yeah, I, th I think that's a good idea. I, I like I like your thinking. We, I we won't think, sue we you. Think alike. I won't <laughs> sue you if you take the idea. I'm, we're putting this on air, David. Make sure to include this in the edit. I said that Media Silo could have this idea. So when you launch it, it just has to be called Nick Gold's Project Silo. That's right. We have to hold off broadcasting this podcast before before that gets released. Oh, yeah, that because we don't want everyone else to steal my awesome idea. Right. right? I mean, obviously, obviously. 
I, I put it out there. You guys are probably in a better position than anyone to execute on all sorts of new ideas that that come your way, right? Or or is it what what's it like? You know, because you know, I think, gosh, you guys have this platform that you know you can spin up VMs and do whatever you want really quickly. You you mentioned having ten developers, and are are you guys pure HTML at this point, or are you using any other third party frameworks? Well, we you know we we use um, enterprise Java for for our back end stuff. Back end, and, sure. And then on the front end, it's all it's all HTML5, JavaScript, and uh, and and certain JavaScript frameworks. But yeah, it's it's all right. pretty pure web stuff. So I'm not mm -hmm. a coder, right? I think about what I just told you, and I'm like, Psh, you should be able to spin that up in like a couple of days, right? I mean, what's it like as you guys are evaluating roadmap and you know having to decide? I mean, is a lot of your development being driven by user requests? Do you guys have a strategic roadmap that you're trying to do to to build the platform into this thing you have a vision of. I'm I'm curious what what drives both the day to day activities and yeah, that's a that's a the great longer question. term yeah. goals. <laughs> that's a great question because it really is like there's so, there, there's there's you know there's no shortage of ideas. <laughs> there's there's good ones and there's bad ones. Yours is yours is certainly a better one. But there's no shortage of ideas and that 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 makes it sometimes hard to focus on you know what 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 do we do? Um, to give you an idea, when we started out, you know even even just even just a year and a half, we were processing maybe, you know, a thousand or or two thousand hours of video a month, and we're now doing um, over thirty thousand hours of video a month that were that that are being uploaded and that need to be processed, and uh, and so the the scale changes also what you're focusing on and where you can add the most value, but uh, you know we tend to listen to our users and and tend to pay close attention to what, what the needs are of the market you know we we released that premier pro panel as as one of the first vendors to have an off the shelf solution that didn't need any customization you can download and install it and all of a sudden within your premier panel you have access to all the media you can import the media you can send quick links from it so we kind of jump on these opportunities sometimes because we feel there's momentum behind something and we also want to support it you know we're big fans of of adobe for pushing this forward Forward and um, giving them feedback on their APIs and, and hope, hopefully making this a better place for, for everyone so that we can develop software and, and solve problems, um, you know, that, that haven't been solvable. But it is, you know, we, on a tactical level, you know, we, we sit down here and we look at the different opportunities and we we do short sprints where we get together and say, let's, let's find a solution to this. So I'll give you an example. The... Um, a few a few months ago, we started on this on this logging project and s started to explore using a browser-based approach to decentralized logging on a large scale. And so we spent a week to build a prototype to just see if it was possible to build an interface. And we share that with sort of our, our trusted customers and we get feedback. And if we feel like the idea has any kind of traction and there's also a, a commercial opportunity here, then we pursue that a little bit faster. But there's also other ideas that kind of die along the way just because there's not enough support, the opportunity is big, isn't big enough, it's just cool but not really you know useful to a large amount of users. So it's sort of weighing the balance between how can we add the most value and, and how can we produce a tool set that is in line with our, our overall mindset. Yikes. Do you ever just bust out the magic eight ball, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, shake it up if you don't like the answer. You know? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, sometimes you, you have to, but uh, that's why talking to customers and, and being part of the conversation is always, is always valuable. A anything in particular, you know, either current or you know, potential, you know, users should, you know, look for in, in terms of your developments that might be coming out. Kai, can you talk a little bit about the desktop application that you mentioned? So we actually have a ton of stuff that's that's about to be released. Um, we uh, are very close to releasing a major update, which is project level uh, permissions. It sounds like a mouthful, but what it does is essentially, uh, right now when you're creating a project in Media Silo, you're able to assign a user to it, but that user has an overall role in the system and a certain set of permissions, like they can upload, they can download, they can edit metadata. And it used to be that it was global for any project you have the same kind of permissions and we're just rolling rolling out an update that lets you set that on a granular level so you may have access to viewing assets in in one project but not downloading 
and in another project you have full access. That's, that's great. That's, yeah, that's, that's really useful. that's huge, Kai. And that's that awesome. really that that changes everything fundamentally, if, if you will. That's sort of the difference between Dropbox and Box, right? Dropbox is sort of you you set basic permission, and in Dropbox, and in, in Dropbox is basic permissions, and in Box you actually have granular controls. And for the enterprise, that's really interesting. But it's it's also great because the second feature that's that's piggybacked on this is project sharing. So you'll be able to invite somebody from another production company on a project. So if you're collaborating, you've got a visual effects studio and a post house, they can now be sharing the same projects on their own media silo account. Which also means if you're a freelancer, you could be, you know, you could have a list of shared projects in your media silo account and have it all under one roof. Um, so that's a big update that's coming out. We're we're also uh, improving our encoding farm. So we're starting to generate a lot more information about files. And I have to be a little bit hush about that because we're finalizing some some negotiations, but um, expect to see more on that front. And then we just recently released uh, the desktop app. Um, and uh, that's really exciting because it's a tool set that it looks very familiar to anyone who's used Hightail or Dropbox. The only difference is that you know, you can upload a file, you can walk away, and when it's done uploading, it'll send to the list of recipients, and you get the full Media Silo Quick Link experience without having to log on to a browser. It just sits in your desktop, and it, you know, it's sort of your companion app for, for sending rough cuts. Gotcha. That's really slick. Mm -hmm. Really slick. Well, you guys sound busy, so I think what we'll do is probably let you get back to being busy with making all of this cool stuff. <laughs> and again, the thing, I, I want to just encourage our clients because, I mean, frankly, you know, we have a handful of people we work with who use Media Silo. They all universally love it and rely on it daily. But I have to say, it's one of those things that, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of baffled as to why, like, 95% of our clients aren't using it, like, actively in their workflows because it's just... It's that much more refined over trying to, you know, shoehorn, you know, YouTube or Vimeo into that role. It's yep. a lot slicker than, you know, giving someone an FTP login. Um, you know, if you've ever struggled with sending large email attachments and things like that, no more problem there. So it just seems so incredibly useful. We've described a few different, you know, very different use cases in terms of review and approval for yep. your clients passing things along to broadcast distribution partners and giving them kind of a self-service gateway. I encourage everyone to try it. And you guys, again, let's be specific about this. You guys make that pretty easy. What what can our listeners do this afternoon, tomorrow, to you know check out for themselves the Media Silo experience? We have a free trial on our site that's free for uh, two weeks. And um, you can choose from... Uh, three different account options and you can also bring your own uh, Amazon credentials. So if you want to be the master of, of storage and uh, are not afraid to you, you know, do a little bit of um, configuration work on, on Amazon and S3, then uh, you can choose that option as well. But yeah, it's a free trial. It's turnkey. You sign up and you're able to use it right away. There's no risk. You can cancel at any time. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very easy to use. Well, we would definitely encourage our clients to get in front of it. Absolutely. Please keep us looped in on any of your experimentations. We probably have answers for you. Again, we are a reseller, and you can act as an intermediary there. But, you know, it's been great to have you on. Pick your brain. We've known you guys for years. We've been doing more active projects that involve Media Silo lately, and that's only going to accelerate with yep. you know, more and more people having on-premise MAMs. I think it actually, if anything, makes it more obvious to them quickly why they also need something in that overall solution. When people get into the MAM space and you know that have never been there before, how fast their minds move to, like, how else could we use this? Like, what are the, what are all the you know potential applications of this? Once they start realizing, like, hey, here's all of our media and we can find it and we can like share it with people, then they start thinking, well, like, how can I show my clients this and all that kind of stuff? So that's when we really. That's where you guys come into the picture. And frankly. again, so many of the systems we work with are, you know, very clearly production asset management systems, mm -hmm. right? They are they are geared both in terms of their look, their aesthetic, their tool set, the the technology itself, how you access it to the set of users inside your gates who are touching the full res media every single day on their production storage. A lot of those platforms 
it's a very distant thought as to like let's put a really nice outwardly facing package on it right. to get it in front of clients to get it in front of our distribution partners you guys are just like the slot in drop in way to answer that that question so i see much more activity with you guys as as us and our clients move forward with all of that fun stuff they just go to mediasilo.com right that's right mediasilo.com Awesome. Kai, it's been a real pleasure talking with you. We can't wait to get this out there and uh, looking forward to much further adventures. Yeah, great to talk Likewise, with you again. Same here. Yeah, we, we look forward to working uh, more with you guys as well. And if, if it uh, wasn't for integrators that understand you know, the whole workflow spectrum, it'd be a much more difficult space to be in. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kai. We'll speak again soon. Okay, take care. And thank you to our listeners. This has been another episode of The Workflow Show. Take care, everyone. The Workflow Show is a production of Chesapeake Systems. We welcome your comments and suggestions for upcoming episodes. You can email us at workflowshow at chesa.com. That's workflowshow at chesa dot com. And if you'd like to talk with a member of our team of experts about your particular digital media workflow needs, email us at prosales at chessa.com. That's prosales at chessa.com. Or call us at 410-752-3406. That's 410-752-3406.